Hello, everyone. Today, we are happy to welcome back Dr. Fausto Rodriguez from Johns Hopkins Hospital. He is continuing with his 11th part neuropath series, and today is his second talk. He's going to speak on neuronal and glioneuronal tumors. As always, please feel free to share your comments or ask your questions on Facebook live feed as well as YouTube window. So thank you, Dr. Rodriguez, again for joining us. Over to Dr. Rodriguez, please. Thank you again. All right. Well, it's a pleasure again to be here uh, presenting a, a, a topic that uh, is uh, uh, close to my heart and that uh, is, is varied and is evolving. And, uh, and I think I'll hope I can present some illustrative cases that will uh, help you uh, diagnose these uh, tumors in your practice. So. Uh, this is, just to get started, the tumors that are classified as neuronal or glioneuronal in the WHO classification uh, of 2016, the update. So a lot of them have persisted through the years uh, with uh, some uh, very few additions. So these are some of them. I will not present all these cases, but I'll present some illustrative cases that are, will fall in this category so, so you are aware that will be helpful to uh, start some discussions. So these are some of the tumors, and they continue here. These are well-established categories that uh, you see from uh, time to time. Let's get started to the cases that uh, hopefully you have a, you had a chance to see, uh, preview the virtual slides that we shared through different media. Um, the first one is a 32-year-old woman that had an intraventricular mass. And we'll go to the virtual slide on case number one. Okay, so you're seeing a tumor right away, you know, is uh, interventricular is calcified. There's a lot of calcifications. You have areas of more cellular tumor you can see composed of cells that are round and so in some areas also elongated slightly elongated in part this may be artifactual you can argue that the chromatin of the nuclei are stippled you have areas that resemble neuropil More calcifications. More here. Something that you also notice that the tumor is relatively cellular, but mitotic activity is not high. In fact, I, we have had a trouble finding even a single mitosis in the fields that I've shown you. So you're probably dealing with something that is favorable. You have some suggestions of a neuronal phenotype, uh, at least on the morphology. Uh, so there, there are certain things that, that help you, uh, in particular with the location to put this tumor in perspective. And we we'll now go to the neuronal markers. And this here is a uh, new N, okay? It's a marker of neuronal differentiation of, um, for well differentiated tumors, and it was positive here in many areas. You have, of course, a bit of artifact, but really a strong, a strongly positive. This is new N. Synaptophysin was also positive. So this is actually a central neurocytoma. which is a well-differentiated WHO grade two tumor uh, that occurs uh, essentially within the ventricles. Uh, historically, the main differential diagnosis has been with oligodendroglioma. And if you go fairly back in the early literature, many of the tumors that were diagnosed as or reported as intraventricular oligodendrogliomas ended up being central neurocytoma when uh, these uh, uh, 
more detailed uh, characterization and phenotyping, electron microscopy, and then phenotyping prove that these are really well differentiated uh, neuronal tumors. And now we know that the genetics, of course, are entirely different. They never have 1P19Q or IDH mutations. So uh, one thing as a practical uh, concern, if you see something inside the ventricles that remind you of oligoendoglioma, uh, probably you're dealing, probably it's not. Oligoendogliomas tend to be hemispheric tumors, uh, usually involve the cortex, at least in part, while uh, uh, neurocyte, central neurocytomas are, are um, intraventricular. There is a counterpart to central neurocytoma, that's the extraventricular neurocytomas that are relatively rare. Uh, but in that case, in particular, if you, the genetics are, again, different. Oligondogliomas now require 1P19Q correlation and IDH mutation for diagnosis, and no other tumor really shares that, that molecular uh, feature. So um, uh, neurocytic tumors, in, in, in contrast, have lack those and have a ex strong expression of a variety of neuronal markers, including uh, particularly new IN is, is helpful because um, new N, uh, not many tumors express it. It's, it's, it's relatively specific for neural differentiation. This is usually, the imaging is very helpful. This is an example, another case of, of central neurocytoma. And you see that's where they occur. They're central, they occur deep in the brain, near the foramen of Monroe. They tend to be associated with the septum pellucidum. Uh, so a large mass like that is fairly telling. And in combination with the morphology, even in frozen sections, you are uh, able to do a, a firm preliminary diagnosis of central neurocytoma with this imaging and the histology, the uniform histology that I showed you earlier. All right. The next case is a 70-year-old woman uh, with a cerebellar mass. This is the imaging. And actually here, the imaging is very, very helpful because this is a T1 and this has no contrast, okay? So you have this bright hyperintensity. There are few, very few things that give you hyperintensity like this in, um, in uh, pre-contrast MRI. So this is not enhancing. This is just the intrinsic T1 hyperintensity uh, in this tumor that is involved in the cerebellum in an adult. Uh, few, one of the things that gives you that is actually fat. Go to case two. And indeed, in this tumor, you have fat, or at least a uh, adipocytic differentiation. The cells are very similar to the cells that I was showing you in this central neurocytoma. Uniform, round, not much for mitotic activity, so you're not concerned about, uh, for example, a medulloblastoma or one of those more aggressive embryonal tumors. And it looks like that, variable fat uh, adipocytic differentiation and round cells. And this is synaptophysin. Again, many of these, these neurocytic tumors, they almost all essentially express synaptophysin. So in that context, the diagnosis here is cerebellar li uh, liponeurocytoma, which is a distinct entity. It's a rare tumor, but that occurs in the cerebellum in adults, and it's really uh, is distinct from uh, both medulloblastomas and central neurocytoma. That being said, there are some cases of central neurocytoma that can have adipocytic differentiation, and we rarely uh, see that. Uh, so, um, but this is really a, a, a distinct entity in the WHO. Moving to the next case, 
40 year old man with uh, also has uh, the uh, cerebellar mass And you're seeing here a trend uh, at tumors that have round cells. So uniformity is a feature of many of these well-differentiated uh, neuronal uh, tumors. And important, the only feature I also want to highlight now is that not everything that has round cells and halos is an oligodendoglioma. You have a variety of tumors that can have round cells with perinuclear halos. This one also has microcysts. Again, we're not seeing much for mitotic activity. Here you have a fragment of cerebellum, so you know you're in the posterior fossa. Again, oligodendogliomas usually do not occur in the posterior fossa. There are rare, very rare exceptions, but for the most part, if you're dealing with something that looks like an oligo, but is in the posterior fossa or is interventricular, probably you're dealing with something else, something to always have in mind. Some hyalinized vessels uh, in areas. And sometimes these tumors may have some subtle features, but something that you start seeing is these fluffy eosinophilic aggregates, spherical in some areas. Some of it is in, this, in the substance of the tumor. Some of it, you can see it around vessels, okay? This type, this is real. This is also neuropeel differentiation or a neuronal, it's another feature reflective of neuronal differentiation is neuropeel in the form of uh, small rosettes, bland tumor, posterior fossa. I'm gonna show you some stains. And this is the most important one, which is synaptophysin. And you start seeing that a lot of those eosinophilic areas are actually synaptophysin positive. These are not axons. This, uh, this is really part of the tumor. But you see a lot of it is deposited around vessels and also in spherical areas. Here, 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 here. And most, a lot of the cells actually, even though this is a neuronal tumor, they don't express it to any, uh, there, it's not very strong. It's almost always limited to those uh, actual rosettes and better area here, you can see that. That's very characteristic of this tumor. Relatively small rosettes and many in a perivascular distribution. So the diagnosis is a Rosette forming glioneuronal tumor first incorporated into the WHO in 2007. It's a WHO grade one tumor. The typical location is the fourth ventricle. It was in fact in the first report of this entity, it was described as a um, possible, a, a, a Rosette forming glioneuronal, glioneuronal tumor of the fourth ventricle uh, and has a lot of uh, features that overlap with this embryoplastic neuroepithelial tumor. So it was cons considered in, in some ways, a, at least that was the initial proposal, a variant of DNT that occurs in uh, the posterior fossa. Uh, we know now occurs not only in the, the case I presented you was described as being mostly in the cerebellum. Most of the cases are usually in, related to the fourth ventricle and the midline like this one here. Uh, but now with this, uh, as any other, this, 
the tumors that are described, you start seeing, you get start getting more experience, and you start seeing them occurring outside of that location. And uh, the op, you know, the the chiasm optic pathways is another area that has been described. There are some that have been described also in the spinal cord. So mostly a posterior fossa tumor related to the cerebellum fourth ventricle, but can also occur in other locations. Just something to have in mind. The genetics of these tumors is distinct, and this is important because some of some of the tumors may have some components that resemble pilocytic astrocytoma or other low grade gliomas. They can add something that has been described frequently has been the presence of pic 3 ca kinase mutation. That was one of the first reports. And also more recently, FDFR1 mutations. This case and this report actually had FDFR1 and, uh, and then developed a pic 3 ca uh, mutation as well. So they tend, uh, these are uh, two uh, genes that are seem to be uh, strongly uh, related to these uh, rosette forming glioneuronal tumors. Moving next to a nine-year-old boy with a frontal lobe mass. Another well differentiated tumor, round cells. Although you tend to see here a bit more uh, variability in some cells that actually have more cytoplasm that resemble astrocytes, solar surrounding vessels. You move around here, a lot of involvement of the parenchyma here, more round cells with some of with, with halos. Here you start seeing hyalinized vessels. So you start getting here some of the more characteristic features of this tumor, hyalinized vessels. In a papillary or pseudo-papillary architecture. Right here. Right here, slightly hyalinized. And if you look closely, you can almost gather that there is a dual tumor population. You have these cells that are eosinophilic surrounding the vessels that are slightly different morphologically to, to the interpapillary cells. Particularly if you move around here, you start seeing there's somewhat different histological. It's low grade, this tumor is low grade, and you see there, we, again, we're not seeing even a single mitosis in all these uh, fields. Some areas are pseudopapillary, some are to start forming more papilla that, that break off. So this is a papillary glioneuronal tumor, another WHO grade one tumor, a category that was incorporated in 2007. Uh, I wanted to show you these two tumors side by side because they frequently uh, get mistaken for each other. They are both WHO grade one tumors. As you notice, the uh, clinical is different. This is another example showing you that frequently they tend to be supratentorial in contrast to rosette forming glioneuronal tumor that is in the fourth ventricle. They tend to uh, make cystic masses well circumscribed. Sometimes they can have a, an enhancing uh, nodule. So cysts with mural nodule configuration, you can see them. Uh, so they tend to present as very uh, benign appearing masses on the scans. That's helpful also because they, some of them can be slightly more cellular. Uh, what is distinctive about this, and I unfortunately I didn't have the stains for that particular case, but this is another case in which I can show you, it's important to know this pattern. You have these, uh, it's a it's a biphasic tumor with a perivascular uh, layer of astrocytes that are GFIP positive and an interpapillary 
areas that are synaptophysing synaptophysing positive so they are kind of mirror images of each other so this is a true glioneuronal tumor relatively rare again supertentorial who grade one this is another tumor now that with enhanced uh te molecular techniques we know that it's a distinct entity and actually there was a fusion uh reported by dr uh, bridge and macomb uh, a, a few years back in which they found this, this actually cytogenetic alteration, nice 17 translocation in some tumors with uh, that was proven to have these uh, LC, SLC44A1 PRKCA uh, fusion. And that has been validated since then in, in, in larger series, uh, showing that this, in fact, they, these tumors have a, a different methylation profile and, and fusions involving, in particular, this gene PRKCA. So the diagnosis is mostly histological, but if you do a lot of sequencing in your practice, that uh, you'll be able to also uh, pick up uh, some of these tumors. And of course, these have uh, therapeutic implications. Okay, next case is an 11 month old girl, young patient. And this is the imaging. This case was actually very challenging. Uh, I was involved on it in a, in a frozen section. Uh, because it has a very widespread abnormalities that were worrying uh, the, the clinicians. There was a wide differential diagnosis, not only of tumor, but also of uh, abscess or something inflammatory. Very scary looking image there. And this is the virtual slide. In contrast to the tumors that I've been see, uh, showing you, this is a more cellular tumor, right? And it has a more, it's composed of mostly spindle cells. A lot of collagen deposition. A lot of collagen deposition, so a bit more spindly. You may even have an, a, a start entertaining the possibility of a mesenchymal neoplasm. And in fact, when we saw these in, in, in frozen section, that was something also that we uh, at least thought of in the differential diagnosis. You start seeing here that it's a relatively circumscribed tumor, it has a sharp border with the brain. Other areas that even look even more mesenchymal with a storyform pattern. Now, if you look closely, you start seeing also some cells that actually have a, a prominent nucleoli, and they tend to look like small neurons or ganglion cells. These are not necessarily well-formed ganglion cells, but ganglioids, sometimes we call them. They're smaller. So you now start having a suggestion of some things that look more like astrocytes. Not much for mitotic activity in this field. And now, in some areas, we started, you can start getting a little bit concerned because you have these now not so much uniform round cells with bland, uh, with perinuclear halos, but something that actually tends to resemble uh, something embryonal. But if you see, not much for mitotic activity here. More of these study from pattern, a lot of collagen deposition. So we'll go into the scope now. So you consider concern about uh, mesenchymal tumor, of course, and they can occur in children. You can have a variety of sarcomas and other things. But this is here, your GFAP, which was very strong. So this is a big clue for this tumor. And the clue is that you have these, um, when you start looking at it, and even the story form areas, you just say, well, this cell's mesenchymal, but when you do the GFAP, most of those cells are actually GFAP positive. So this is in part, at least, an astrocytoma. Lot of GFAP, uh, GFAP positive cells. 
And then you look at the synaptophysin and start seeing less uh, synaptophysin deposition. But a lot of those smaller cells are synaptophysin positive. Those are these cells that I was referring to as ganglioid, small ganglion cells, which is a highly characteristic of this tumor. So, and you can have even a larger ganglion cells here and there like this one. A bit here getting into the neuropil. More ganglion cells here. Okay. So The diagnosis here is desmoplastic infantile ganglioma. It's a tumor that uh, has been recognized for actually a number of decades now. Very low grade, tends to occur in very young patients, and um, it's a WHO grade one. It, despite those being presenting as large masses, oftentimes they tend to do very well. They tend to be very well behaved tumors. I, I showed you a field there also that I wanted to for you to have in mind, which was that a round cell component, you can have areas that resemble an embryonal tumor or resemble even a, a glioblastoma or a high-grade astrocytoma. And of course, those are things that scare you and you have to really at least highlight in your reports, but many of these tumors actually do well, even with the, when those components are present. Hope, uh, particularly if you know if they're a focal finding, you should highlight it, but they, they still are compatible with a very, with a low-grade neoplasm. And some tumors can behave more aggressively, of course, like in any CNS tumor, but having areas that are scary like those should not dissuade you from this diagnosis and for identification of these tumors as uh, a more uh, favorable tumor actually to have than many other things that you'll see in the CNS. It's biphasic, the ganglion cells many times are small and can be actually almost entirely absent. So there is still a category recognized as desmoplastic infantile astrocytoma when you don't see the ganglion cell component. Uh, but uh, most of those cases are probably the same thing. It's just that you have the ganglion cell component can be very focal and missed uh, depending on sampling uh, or other uh, issues. Moving to the next case, 20-year-old man with seizures and a cortical mass. Case number six. Okay, again. Low grade neoplasm. You have really a theme here. And you see cells that, again, round, a lot of myxoid stroma, very round, a lot of myxoid deposition. Relatively well circumscribed in some ways. You have here brain parenchyma that is not involved, and more of this tumor here, composed of these round cells. Now, for many of these tumors, it's good to try to get a feel of what the architecture looks like, but uh, it's not always possible, you know, uh, when you have a fragmented tissue in, in the um, in the, some of these specimens. Calcifications, again, calcifications are common in many tumors. Uh, it's not, uh, it's, it, you can see it in many different contexts.
So the tumor is relatively uniform. Again, not much for mitotic activity. So we know from the start that we are dealing with something favorable. Lot of round cells, lot of microcysts. All right, and something that uh, it's relatively helpful in the identification of these tumors. Of course, you have to start thinking about an infiltrating glioma because you're seeing actually a lot of entrapped uh, neurons. Now, oligoendogliomas have a feature that is very highly characteristic, which is perineuronal satellitosis. So every time you have involvement of the cortex, you have a lot of cells that are actually uh, surrounding the neurons. And this tumor, something that you, you tend to see is that actually the neurons ten, uh, tend to be spared. You don't have a significant degree of satellitosis. And sometimes you can even envision that they are uh, in within mucin lakes or mixoid with mixoid uh, changes. So uh, these are sometimes referred as floating neurons. And that is one feature that is a uh, characteristic of this tumor. Of course, you, you want to have a combination of features, but this is something that uh, tends to favor uh, this particular diagnosis over that of uh, oligodendoglioma. You here start seeing a bit of tissue hyalinization, chronicity, again, not much for mitotic activity. We can move on the stains now. This is OLIC2, strongly positive. And these round cells. OLIC2 is a very useful stain for us in the CNS. Uh, we use it uh, We use it as a glial marker, but it actually highlights many of the uh, glioneuronal tumors that we have uh, been discussing. And we have here Nguyen which is actually negative in this uh, small round cell, so there are not neurocytes necessarily, but it is helpful in highlighting the extent of cortical involvement and telling you that there's some organization to it, and therefore, most of these neurons that you're seeing in this uh, case are represent probably entrapped neurons. And are probably not neoplastic. So the diagnosis in this case is a disembroplastic neuroepithelial tumor. A lot of features of it, uh, the, all the, the architectural features were not well evident here. That's why in this t uh, tumor type in particular, the clinical presentation and the imaging is very helpful because some the, many of these tissues uh, tumors uh, come fragmented like in this case, and it's difficult to tell the nodularity and the architectural features are very key to the diagnosis of this tumor. So what is a DNT? It's a WHO grade one tumor that is cortically based, usually associated with chronic seizures. Remember that any tumor in the CNS can give you seizures. Uh, it's, it's one of the manifestations, but chronic seizures, epilepsy, uh, is a bit more helpful in suggesting this particular diagnosis. It's a tumor of young people. Most patients are under 20 years of age. Uh, there have been other controversial uh, uh, forms like non-specific that have been suggested in the past that have a lot of overlapping features with other glial tumors like pilocytics etc and now that we have more um, phenotyping and genetic testing i think this has become a bit more uh, obsolete and they also can be associated with this plastic cortex and in some series you can see a high uh, frequency of uh, coexisting 
a cortical dysplasia. This is what your typical DNT looks like. It's usually a cortical-based lesion. The temporal lobe is favored, and you have this little bubbly appearance in, in the imaging. This is T2, little nodules here confined to the cortex. That's highly characteristic of this tumor. Uh, and sometimes you can see that in when you have an intact specimen like this, in which you can see these corresponding myxoid nodules of tumor. That is highly characteristic and almost diagnostic of this tumor. They have, of course, stained very strongly for Alcyon blue. Well-behaved tumor almost never uh, transforms to malignancy. They can be managed either followed or actually if they are symptomatic for epilepsy, they, they, they can be resected, but they uh, are almost never uh, transformed to higher grades. There are exceptional cases out there in the literature, but that is really, for practical purposes, one of the most uh, indolent and, and bland tumors that you'll see in the CNS. It's considered a glioneuronal tumor. Uh, that Even that has been debated by, by some authors because the neuronal elements that are convincing, for example, those neurons uh, seem to be actually entrapped in a, a lot of the electromicroscopy and other early studies uh, were, of course, difficult uh, in practice to separate true entrapped elements from uh, neuronal differentiation in the tumor cells. So uh, that is still debatable, but still, for the current time, still uh, considered a glioneuronal tumor. Next case, 15-year-old girl with a parietal lobe mass. Another tumor that we're seeing here that is relatively monotonous. Cells here are a bit more elongated. So if you look at them, the, your first, your concern will be probably about a low-grade glioma of some kind. Now you move around. Again, glial, not much for mitotic activity. In some areas, you start seeing getting more of these perinuclear halos. Cells start looking a bit rounder. Rounder and almost oligondoglial like. So another tumor has some uh, a variable uh, morphology. In the past, probably I would have placed this in the category of oligoastrocytoma, but we are not using that category anymore. Now we know that we are finding distinct entities that can be uh, used instead, uh, particularly if you uh, study these, uh, these cases in detail. So actually, this tumor was uh, interpreted as low-grade neuroepithelial tumor consisting with polymorphous low-grade neuroepithelial tumor of the young. And you see, this is not technically considered a glioneuronal tumor, but this is another term that you're seeing in the context of many of these tumors that fall under this rubric is neuroepithelial. Basically, uh, these are tumors that we uh, postulate that they derive you know, for components of the neural tube. So they are not technically classic glial tumors. They don't have the sometimes convincing uh, neuronal phenotype that will place it into a specific category. So sometimes uh, you do that. Now, polymorphous low-grade uh, neuropathial tumor has uh, quite a few distinct uh, uh, features. This particular case was evaluated uh, and found to have an FGFR1 TAC1 fusion which has been actually describing particularly a lot of FGFR1 abnormalities in this uh, particular tumor, which uh, seems to be an entity and uh, that is distinct, has a distinct me uh, methylation profile. 
has frequent CD34 expression uh, in genetic alterations uh, involving the MAP kinase pathway, particularly these FGFR alterations in the form of, of mutations or uh, oftentimes, like this particular case, infusions. They tend to have calcifications. The case, the, the slide that I showed you didn't show it, uh, but um, certainly uh, is a frequent feature as, as well as uh, that FGFR, uh, uh, FGFR alteration. This is another case uh, that actually I saw and I think represents this entity as well that has actually has more of the typical classifications variable morphology, very low grade, very high procellar in areas. Has areas that look a bit more astrocytic. Some rounder cells. And again, a consistent finding in the immunophenotype is strong CD34 expression. They don't express neuronal markers usually. So they're negative for NUN, negative for synaptophysing in the tumor cells for the most part, but they express consistently CD34. And again, have those alterations that I mentioned, low grade tumors. Um, so another evolving category uh, of tumors that of course fall in the differential diagnosis of many of these glioneuronal and low grade glial tumors that tend to occur in young patients. Now moving to the spinal cord. The spinal cord is another place where you can see uh, glioneuronal tumors and uh, some of them are circumscribed, easy to resect. Some of them you may get small biopsies. So it's, it's good to, to have this uh, in mind when you're evaluating spinal cord lesions. Okay, so on low power, you can see that this tumor is fairly circumscribed. Very fairly circumscribed, which is a reassuring finding. If you go on high power, you're also seeing a lot of uh, blood channels. You can argue there's a slight space between the tumor cells and the vessels, but it really doesn't quite look like the fine fibrillary process of ependymoma. Now, I tell you, this tumor gets many times, it's relatively rare in at this location, but uh, happens, and it gets mistaken for, for a ependymoma. That's a frequent, uh, not a, it's a question that we get from time to time in the, in the consultation service. And that this case, well, it looks like an ependymoma, but it's not classic. And of course, you do the stains and uh, you uh, oftentimes find clues for the diagnosis. And this is actually a paraganglioma of the phylum terminale. So they tend to occur in the CNS distally in the area of the phylum terminale. So they get, that's another location where you get mixopapillary ependymomas, which is the main entity in the differential diagnosis. You can have I guess, uh, you can have more variable morphology in contrast to paragangliomas at other sites. Many of these actually have ganglion cell differentiation, which also can uh, compound the problem. But they uniformly express neuronal markers, synaptophysin, chromogranin, and they don't uh, express glial markers uh, or EMA. So those are that's something that is very helpful when you see it. Well circumscribed, well behaved tumors at that at that location. Something also that is a characteristic of these tumors is that they frequently express keratins. So, uh, which uh, I know we use it sometimes in other areas of surgical pathology uh, to differentiate neuroendocrine tumors like uh, carcinoids or low-grade low neuroendocrine carcinomas from paragangliomas by using an expression of keratins as something that may differentiate them. And the CNS keratin expression by paraganglioma is actually relatively frequent and it's still uh, can be associated with a WHO grade one tumor, 
which is uh, paraganglioma. Well circumscribed and you sometimes you get these really intact specimens because they are distal and associated with the phylum. So diagnosis paraganglioma of the phylum terminale. Next case, 35-year-old man with a spinal cord mass. All right, seems to be from the bat a low-grade tumor, right? A lot of uh, here more hyaline stroma, cells that appear to be more glial, elongated, some possible pigment. I'd like to say that some of it may be melanin, some of it may be um, hemosiderin deposition. Eosinophilic granular bodies. A very important morphologic feature that is important to recognize in surgical neuropathology because it's, it's typically associated, particularly when numerous, with low-grade neoplasms. So from the bat, you can start seeing these. When you see a lot of these, you have to start thinking away from a diagnosis of high-grade glioma or infiltrating glioma of some kind because it tends not to be present in those tumors. You may even have a suggestion here of some horizontal fibers. And now you start seeing cells that look neuronal, but what is different about them is that they have a binucleation. So that is a strong suggestion that they are neoplastic in nature. So they are not entrapped ganglion cells like happen in many of the tumors that you see. These are probably neoplastic. More of these here. Sometimes they can be multinucleated, even have more than one nucleus. Another binucleated ganglion cell. Hallonized vessels. Again, seems to be a low grade neoplasm. A lot of more of these eosinophilic granular bodies, probably, and some of these. Yep, a lot of eosinophilic granular bodies. See, so I may have some stains as well. This is synaptophysin. Of course, synaptophysin is very sensitive for neuronal differentiation. Sometimes it's difficult to interpret because it stains a lot of the entrapped neuropil. Uh, but here we are seeing quite a few stain, area staining. And of course, you have these cells here. This may even represent a binucleated uh, ganglion cell that is strong, it's synaptophysin positive. Oftentimes in ganglioma, the synaptophysin is pericarial, so it's in the surface of the cell. Um, so, uh, and a lot of, it, a lot of really synaptophysin positivity in this tumor. Another one there. Let's see what else we have for stains. K67, low, that goes with the low-grade nature of this tumor. 
So gangliomas can occur in the spinal cord. It's something to have in mind and that um, sometimes you can have, of course, uh, gliomas tend to be more, more common, but you really have to have in mind that gangliomas can occur in many places in the, in the uh, central nervous system. They tend to be, uh, the temporal lobe is uh, favored as a location for gangliomas, but again, they can occur in many different places. And uh, something else to have in mind is that you can have a variety of tumors that show ganglion cell differentiation. We are recognizing those more now, but if you have a dominant clustering of abnormal ganglion cells with a low grade glial component, most of the time you can get by calling these uh, gangliomas. So ganglioma of the spinal cord. The last case is going to be a uh, six month old with multiple lesions. And I shared with you a slide that is actually an autopsy slide. So, but it was a very illustrative of, of this tumor type and I wanted to share it with you. Of course, you, you're never going to get a whole section of the spinal cord in a surgical specimen. So these specimens tend to be small actually in practice. So what you see in the spinal cord itself looks okay. You see, you, you recognize here the classic H of the gray matter surrounded by a synophilic white matter, typical of the architecture of the spinal cord. What was typical here was, or abnormal, was the leptomeninges. And you start seeing some sort of infiltrate involving leptomeninges. As so say, leptomeninges are, tend to be thinner than this. This is ab definitely abnormal, expanded by a proliferation of cells. Some of these are round. You have a lot of collagen, a lot of collagen here, a lot of collagen there. Very bland is enveloping nerve roots. Here is another section involving here showing the nerve roots that are being engulfed by this infiltrate. And all levels of this section here. You can see here, many of the cells are round and bubbly. Oftentimes, uh, these are small biopsies. The clinical presentation, we, we are dealing with a process that is actually disseminating in the leptomeninges. And many of these patients uh, come with slowly evolving symptoms for a long time. And um, when these biopsies are prone to be mistaken for some sort of reactive inflammatory process, because the cells here resemble, in, in some ways, uh, macrophages. They are small, bland, associated with fibrosis, and with clear cytoplasm. But in fact, this is a neoplasm. A bit more collagen deposition here. I actually have additional slides of this case from other areas. This is actually the cerebellum showing you a, a lot of dissemination. Again, very thickened leptomeninges. By uh, cells that actually resemble many uh, oligoendoglia. So it's actually disseminated in the spine, uh, around the spinal cord, and also in the intracranial compartment. Another area of uh, cerebrum with these round cells. Here is start getting a little bit more cellular and more evident that this is a tumor. You 
in more of this desmoplasia. So actually the diagnosis here is a disseminated leptomeningeal glioneuronal tumor. As the name implies, it's disseminated. Many of these tumors really disseminate in the, in the CNS. The typical imaging, and this is another case, is this. You have these widespread abnormalities, contrast enhancing, involving the leptomeninges, but also these bubbly lesions involving the superficial cortex. So they are really superficial tumors. Uh, involving throughout the CNS. Uh, oftentimes you have a small parenchymal uh, lesion that can be the putative primary, uh, but we also have seen cases in which you can uh, have re-entry into the CNS and causing more uh, multifocal lesions. So it's a disseminated process, very low grade for the most part. These Many of these patients can actually live decades with really widespread abnormalities. So indolent tumor, but widespread uh, problem. This is what it looks like, right? Uh, you have this proliferation of, of round cells with uh, bland cytoplasm. In the past, this has been uh, referred to as uh, disseminated oligodendogliomatosis or uh, oligodendoglial-like in our series. That's how we term them because they resemble a lot of oligo, uh, oligodendogliomas. Uh, they don't have the same genetics, of course, which is what makes it different. Now, they are Play, this entity now is in the WHO uh, provisional diagnosis in the WHO update of 2016 uh, as a glioneuronal tumor. And most of the cases uh, do not uh, have round cells. They tend to express glial markers like OLIC2 and S100. Synaptophysin is variable, but you can have in, in, in cases overt ganglion cell differentiation. So they, they have, uh, at least a subset of them have ganglion, overt ganglion cell differentiation. Uh, here illustrated by strong synaptophysin staining, and uh, therefore uh, they can uh, be a true uh, glioneuronal tumors. The, the genetics are also in some ways distinct. Uh, most of these tumors uh, now we know have a loss of the whole arm of 1P with intact 19Q, and this is something that was very evident when these tumors were tested um, since oligoendoglioma was the main entity in the differential diagnosis. And now we know that in addition to that, they tend to have the BRAF kia fusion typical of phallocytic. So these combi combined alterations are very typical. They never have IDH mutation, at least in, in its classic form. Of course, you can have also oligoendogliomas that disseminate in the leptomeninges rarely. So that's something that you have to have in uh, in the differential diagnosis. But this combination of 1P loss and BRAF kia is present in, in the majority of the of the classic cases. Uh, so, uh, which tells you that probably this is something different from just your conventional uh, palocytic astro and oligoendoglioma. All right. So that's all we have for cases. Now uh, I want I had some. Um, questions that I wanted to pass by to uh, really um, um, to cover some of the key findings that we uh, or key features that we discussed. First one, so what morphologic finding is most suggestive of a neoplastic ganglion cell? Binucleation, chromogranin, immunoreactivity, co-expression of glial markers, dense nasal substance or macronucleoli. The answer is A, binucleation. If you see uh, binucleation is very rare in uh, normal uh, neurons, you can have reactive changes in normal neurons. Uh, sometimes they can look even funny when you have an infiltrate of a glial tumor, for example. But true binucleation, when it's more than one cell, when you see it, when you start seeing it more in, in, in aggregates of, of, of ganglion cells, that really is very convincing finding that suggests that the tumor is actually a uh, bino is, is, is neoplastic. 
Second question, papillary glioma tumor is characterized by diffuse growth pattern, high-grade histologic features, interventricular location, peripapillary GFAP glial component, and interpapillary neuronal component, or well-formed rosettes. Give you a few minutes there, a few seconds. We got answers like D coming. D. Okay. D as in dog? Yep. Okay, and that's correct. So that is really what characterizes this tumor in its uh, original description. Uh, it has, it's a biphasic tumor that has this pretty vascular glial component uh, that is, uh, and also a neuronal component in the interpapillary areas, resemble neurocytes uh, as well. They can have also areas that resemble pilocytic. They can sometimes have ganglion cells, but this is really what is distinct about this tumor. Next case, desmoplastic infantile ganglioma typically presents uh, with a diffuse pattern of growth in intraventricular locations, young patients, small intracortical, in the form of small intracortical nodules, or with leptomeningeal dissemination. Couple of A coming up. Someone says C. All right, and the answer is actually C. Uh, these are tumors used typically, they're well circumscribed tumors, even though they're large and develop in, in very young patients. Um, so that's something that's many times a clue. When you have a large hemispheric cystic mass in a child, that's one of the main, the first thing that you, you, you have to really uh, think about. They tend to be hemispheric rather than interventricular, uh, and they usually uh, do not disseminate. These are well-behaved tumors for the most part. Another one discussing this uh, relatively newly described tumor, polymorphous low-grade neuropathical tumor of the young, characterized at the molecular level by BRAF-Kia fusions, EGFR point mutations, FGFR alterations, histone H3 mutations, or MIB rearrangements. Someone okay. can see. Okay. And in fact, C is the right uh, answer. So FGFR alterations are uh, typical uh, of these tumors. They have MAP in, in global, you can have other MAP kinase pathway activating alterations. They never have BRAF Kia, that's typical, as I mentioned, of pilocytic astrocytomas and of these uh, diffuse uh, leptomeningeal, leptomeningeal glioneuronal tumor, but they are not typical of these uh, plenties. Um, they can have BRAF V6 on the region occasion, but uh, for the most part, FGFR alteration, either fusions with TAC or point mutations are, have been described in many of these uh, tumors. And I think that's all I have for you for cases and questions. Uh, some of the images here I, I've taken from our iPad app uh, that uh, I've shared with you in the past, um, uh, which is available um, for, for iPads, uh, actually. And I leave it open for other for questions that you may have or, or comments.
I don't see any question coming up from uh, either in YouTube or Facebook. So once again, thank you, Dr. Rodriguez, for this uh, in-depth discussion on neuronal bioneuronal tumors. And thank you, all the viewers. And it's a pleasure to see so many viewers from uh, far off countries like Thailand, Syria, Egypt, Russia, Brazil, Dominican Republic, among others. And as always, uh, feel free to follow our Facebook page that is Petcast and also subscribe to our YouTube channel. And please, uh, you can uh, subscribe to our newsletter, which is available on our website, pathologycast.com. So Dr. Rodriguez's uh, third lecture in the series is coming up on April 30th, so, and he will be covering meningiomas. Also stay tuned to our next podcast, which is uh, on liver pathology. That is on uh, April 12th, and this will be presented by Dr. Emma Fart from University of Pennsylvania. So this would be the first of our two-part series. So she's going to uh, talk on learning to love the liver logically. Thank you again, Dr. Rodriguez, and thanks, everyone. Thanks very much for all your participation, and uh, see you next month.